Hello, AP Macro students. It's me, Mr. Sanabria. Good to see you. Um, hopefully, you're enjoying um, studying and getting ready for the AP exam here in these final uh, few days or a couple of weeks. Um, hopefully, by now, you've already worked on the long FRQ. Um, hopefully, you didn't find it too challenging. We're going to now go through the answers to the long FRQ from 2015. I'm going to tell you how it was scored and the things you should have thought about as you went through it. I'm not going to waste any more of your time here. Uh, let's get right into it. I'm just going to shift the camera over here to my whiteboard and let's get going. The question starts by stating um, that one should assume that the United States economy is operating below full employment. A, draw a correctly labeled graph of the long-run aggregate supply, short-run aggregate supply, and aggregate demand, and show each of the following. So what you're going to need to do is draw an aggregate model. This is how these things often start. You need to be able to draw an aggregate supply and demand graph with no problems. And it wants you to do long-run aggregate supply as well as aggregate demand. And remember, you're needing to show this economy in a uh, recession operating below full employment. So you're going to have to see a recessionary gap here. So short run aggregate supply, aggregate demand come together like this. Um, you are going to also need to show each of the following. You have to show the current equilibrium output and price level labeled as Y1 and PL1. Current output and price level are at equilibrium. So PL1 and Y1. Now for me, I like to always show that full employment would be right under long run aggregate supply. So that's what I think you should see. And um, you have to go ahead and give yourself a point if you see this. Now, um, I said that I like to see full employment right here. Well, so does the AP exam uh, writers, but they gave you a whole other question for that. They said show in part two full employment output labeled as YF, and you would just put that here. Now, if you didn't put a full employment, you could just put the YF there. And if you did have full employment, it is okay to just put it right underneath. However you have it, you need to have Y full uh, just under where long run aggregate supply is. For that, you get another point. So, part B. It says, assume that the Federal Reserve targets a new Fed funds rate to reach full employment. Should the Federal Reserve target a higher or lower Fed funds rate? So, all you have to do is look at this and recognize that this economy is in a recession. In order to combat a recession, the Federal Reserve Bank is going to do an expansionary policy and so you have to write that the Fed is going to target a lower Fed funds rate target. So if you said the Fed is going to target a lower Fed funds rate then you got another point. So if we're keeping track right now we are three points into the FRQ. Two of the points are for simply drawing an aggregate model correctly and labeling it the way they said to, and you should be able to do that. The third point is given for identifying that in a recession, the Fed should target a lower Fed funds rate. So that's three points so far, three points that you should get. Um, number, or I should say rather, letter C. Given the Fed, Federal Reserve action you identified in Part B, which remember that was a lower Fed funds rate target, okay? So keeping track of that, um, given the action you identified in Part B, draw a correctly labeled graph of the money market and show the effect of nominal interest, sort of the effect on nominal interest rates. So money market graph. Here we go. You want to compare nominal interest with the quantity of money, the vertical money supply, and downward sloping money demand, and of course that is the M1 supply of money. So, what you need to do is draw this correctly labeled money market graph and that's going to give you a point. Now what you have to do is actually show the effect of the uh, lower Fed funds rate target. And you need to show that effect on nominal interest rates. So 
How do you show an expansionary policy? Increase the money supply. Oh, let's just make that one. And importantly, you need to show the effect on nominal interest rates. It turns takes nominal interest rates and it lowers it. You might want to put one, two. That's probably your best answer. It shows that you have um, shown a decrease in nominal interest rates. So that's worth another point. We're up to five points so far. This is another example of points that I think you should get. You need to be able to draw your money market graph. You need to be able to show monetary policy on that money market graph. Now part D, and this FRQ maybe gets a little more challenging at this point. It says policymakers pursue a fiscal policy rather than a monetary policy from part B. Assume that the marginal propensity to consume is don't need that anymore. 0.8, and the value of the recessionary gap is $300 billion. Okay, so part one of this. If the government changes its spending without changing taxes to eliminate the recessionary gap, cal calculate the minimum required change in government spending. Well, how do we measure the impact of a change in spending on aggregate demand? through the spending multiplier. We need to figure out the spending multiplier. If the marginal propensity to consume is 0.8, that makes the marginal propensity to save 0.2. 1 over MPS equals 1 over 0.2 equals 5. So our spending multiplier is 5. So what amount of spending times 5 equals 300 billion, right? That's what we need to come up with. And so um, the answer there with a little bit of pretty simple um, algebra is 60 um, billion dollars. Does that make sense? 60 billion dollars times five would give you the 300 billion dollars that you need. So there is your answer. And that one was a little more challenging. It, it, caught, it required you to remember your spending multipliers, which you should do. And you actually had to kind of work backwards here. So I thought that was a, a pretty uh, tricky question for them to ask you. Um, instead of saying, well, what would be the impact of 60 billion dollars in spending? They said, we need to get to 300 billion. How much do we need to spend? So you did have to work backwards there. Um, but I think uh, you can handle it, and that ends up giving you $60 billion. That is worth one rubric point. So if you're keeping track, we're up to eight now. I'm, getting, I'm actually getting lost. I'm having a hard time keeping track with that. So the next part says this. If the government changes taxes without changing government spending to eliminate the recessionary gap, so instead of increasing spending, we're going to cut taxes. Will the minimum required change in taxes be greater than, smaller than, or equal to the minimum required change in government spending? And explain. Here's the thing. Um, let's, we have to know the tax multiplier here in order to get this right. So the tax multiplier is negative MPC over MPS. Now, I'll put over here our spending multiplier that we already came up with um, is 5, right? Keeping that in mind. Well. We need to put negative 0.8 over 0.2 to get the tax multiplier, don't we? That equals negative 4, right? So if we cut taxes, it's going to have a, a uh, positive impact um, times 4, right? So let's imagine that we cut the same $60 billion worth of taxes, right? So instead of increasing spending by $60 billion like we determined we needed to, in the first part, we cut taxes by the same amount. Let's try that out. So $60 billion times 4 equals what? $24 billion, or I'm sorry, $240 billion. That is less than the amount of stimulus that we need. So we're going to have to cut taxes by a greater amount. 
Does that make sense? I hope it does. You needed to say that the uh, minimum required change in taxes will be greater than the minimum required change in government spending. So you needed to say greater than. Okay. Now why? You have to explain this. And this is actually kind of a tricky explanation. How come you have to cut taxes more than spending? Well, one way you could state this is by saying that the tax multiplier, um, which is negative 4, in this case, is smaller than the spending multiplier of 5. And the reason for that is because when you take um, a tax cut, an initial part of that um, increase in taxes is going to be saved, right? Because families save, on average, 0.2% of an increase in income. So if we cut your taxes, your income increases by, um, say, $60 billion, but 20% of that is going to get saved in that initial round. And so the impact is smaller. So you get a point for that explanation. So now we're up to nine points. Um, so the last two points here for section E. Assume that the government lowers income tax rates to eliminate the recessionary gap. Will each of the following increase, decrease, or stay the same? Here we are at aggregate demand, explain, and long run aggregate supply, explain. You are welcome to draw yourself an aggregate supply and demand graph to help you think about this, but it is not required to draw an aggregate supply and demand graph. Okay, I'll go ahead and draw one because it's going to help me explain the answer, but keep in mind that the grader, which in this case is you, are not going to be grading a graph, you're grading a word answer. So part one says, how is the lower income tax um, how will it affect aggregate demand? You should definitely get this because lower taxes is expansionary fiscal policy and we know that that's an increase in aggregate demand. So what you needed to say was that aggregate demand will increase and you do need to explain it because lowering income taxes will increase disposable income and or consumption investment or end investment. So I would just say aggregate demand will increase because lower taxes leads to increased disposable income, which leads to increased aggregate demand um, through actually increased consumption spending, which leads to increased aggregate demand. Okay, so you needed to explain that. You needed to explain that cutting taxes raises disposable income and leads to more consumption. And for the last part, long run aggregate supply. How will the tax cut um, affect long run aggregate supply? This is an interesting one because you could have actually said anything. You could have said it was going to stay the same. Um, you could have said that it will increase and you could have said that it would decrease based on the explanation that you give. Now what I would have said here is that nothing would happen to long run aggregate supply because we did not have, we saw no change in resources. Okay, you could have said that. There's no change in long run aggregate supply because there was no change in resources because we need to increase land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship in order to change long run aggregate supply, right? Grow the economy. Now, you could have actually said that long run aggregate supply is going to increase because the lower taxes would lead to uh, lower savings and that would then lead to increased investment which would lead to more capital, okay? so. Um, that is how it could have increased. So less savings equals um, more lending, more borrowing by companies, more investment. That's going to lead to um, an increase in capital, which would lead to finally longer run aggregate supply. And you could have actually said that one point would be earned for stating that long run aggregate supply would decrease in the long run. And the way you would get to a decrease in long run aggregate supply would be through um, basically making a crowding out argument, saying that lower taxes is going to increase um, interest rates, 
um, in the loanable funds market, and that would then crowd out investment. There'd be less capital, and long-run aggregate supply would shift to the left. So there are the answers for the long FRQ. Tried to get through that as quickly as I could. Um, hope you did well, and go ahead and work on question number two.